said, I am going to plan to have part two up by next week. Instead of doing what I did for the midsummer videos, I waited like six months in between each video. The plan is to have the second part next week, if not next week, the week after that. Ooh, y'all gonna be mad at me today. Y'all gonna be mad, cause this is a beat and this is not me putting it on. It's just already on. I am so sorry. Rest in peace. I Hello everyone, it's Kendall here. And if you're new around here, welcome. And if you're not new around here, what is up home skillet biscuit? And happy Saturday. If you don't know what Saturdays are, Saturday is when I do a little something on my channel, generally called Bad Movies in a Beat, the series on my channel where I talk about bad movies while putting my makeup on. But this week we're not talking about a bad movie and my makeup is already on, so. Good movies and a glam is the really corny title we ended up coming up with, but I also am not putting my glam on. It's just a title, roll with it, it's fun. This week, we're actually continuing on with last week. Today's two-parter, this is the second part. We're continuing our discussion around La Piel Que Habito, The Skin I Live In, 2011 and um, last week we just kind of talked about the movie itself and I tried as hard as possible to not lend too much of my own opinion in it and this week I'm just talking a lot including some opinion including some think pieces from you guys actually it, it actually ended up being quite um, a fruitful conversation about certain things by just reading your experiences, uh, biscuits fam in the comment section. So that's actually really fun and will be exciting to get into because I'm a nerd and at one point I wanted to be a professor so I can live out the dream without having to do all of the shit that they require. It's a lot. Bitch, they be in school for like eight years and I'm like, to read books? Like, what the hell? Before we get into that, we're gonna send it over to today's sponsor because I'm feeling kinda energized and ready for the day. And it might have something to do with uh, the obscene amount of coffee I've drunk <laughs> in the last few hours. So send it over to Admiral Kenny, let's go. Why, hello there everyone. It's Admiral Kenny, fresh from waking up and in need of coffee. Good thing that today's video is sponsored by Cometeer. Cometeer delivers high quality coffee to your house every month. Each month you'll get pucks that are 100% brewed coffee that are flash frozen, fresh, <laughs> flash, frozen at peak freshness and flavor. Mm, bars. <laughs> Keep the flash frozen coffee in your freezer and then when you want to prepare it, all you have to do is take it out, either melt the puck or keep it solid. So if you want hot coffee, feel free to just run the puck under some warm water. Do not put it in the microwave. The things are made out of aluminum, don't do that. <laughs> because I almost did and then I read and it was like, don't do it. And I'm like, okay, sis, reading is fundamental, but melt it enough so that you can squeeze it open and then put hot water over it and you can make hot coffee that way. Or if you want to, you can let it melt completely either in the refrigerator or the same method I was talking about before, just running it under hot water and put it into cold water so that you can have iced coffee. Feel free to add creamer or sweetener to your liking. It is your coffee after all. This way you can have amazing quality coffee from the comfort of your own home without having to go out and without having to go spend more money on very expensive coffee. You're welcome. And for a very limited time, especially for my viewers, you guys can save a lot of moolah because you can get 40% off plus free shipping by using my code KennyJD40. Commentator never does this. It's a really big offer. You should really look into it if you are interested. So big thanks again to Commentator for sponsoring today's video. Now let's get on to the debauchery, baby. Oh, before we get started, check the shirt. It says overweight, sexually broken loser. Shout outs to Fundy Fridays. If you watch Fundy Fridays, I hope you watch it because I love Fundy Fridays. Hey y'all, y'all don't know me. Your bitch is in the merch and it's cute. Anyway, so again, last week we talked about The Skin I Live In, uh, a Spanish film. If you have not seen that video or have not seen the movie, this entire experience will be very confusing. <laughs> the Skin I Live In is an incredibly dense film about a man who kidnapped his daughter's gave him a forced sex change, made him look like his dead wife, and started f***ing him. So, a lot to unpack. Are my hands ashy? I usually am. But yeah, with a storyline like that, uh, it's no shocker that I needed to split this into two parts. That video was more so just letting you know what happened in case uh, any of the subject matter was too triggering for you or just you had no interest in actually seeing the movie, but you wanted to kind of know what's going on or maybe even prompt you to go see the movie because you may 
have found it interesting, but I hope it, but I definitely spoiled it. And as suspected, the video did lean to quite a bit of really interesting and fruitful discussion in all types of directions. And that's kind of what I'm here to kind of report on today and also issue in some of my own interpretations of the film, if you will. So that's what I'm gonna do. Of course, if you haven't seen that video, that'll be linked up above and below actually, because it's a first parter. Those will also be in the Bad Movies and a Beat playlist, as well as the Good Movies and a Glam playlist. So like I said last week, I'd be lying if I didn't say that I actually enjoyed this film. However, there is a lot that's worthy of controversy and really dense subject matter in regards to like gender and sex and depending on how you feel about how they handled certain elements of both of those things, it could be very much so a um, fruitful or damaging conversation around both of those topics as well as how that fits into kind of transphobic narratives. Um, so with that said, verbal trigger warning, cause a lot of people told me that they were really thankful for the, particularly the dysphoria um, warning. So I'll, here it is again, it'll be essay, gender dysphoria, transphobia, depending on um, kind of sort of narratives that can be built around this film perhaps. So Robert as a villain, a monster, a vengeful father, um, are all these kind of whining questionable understandings and interpretations of him as a character, right? And in many ways, Robert is this sort of science fiction roided up version of toxic masculinity. Do you need to be roided up? Toxic masculinity does its shit pretty well on its own, but he is kind of almost a caricature of these masculine structures that do little to protect women. Um, but simply render them down to object and possession. Understanding Robert as that, as opposed to say a loving father, a vengeful father, a loving husband, a vengeful husband. How else am I supposed to make sense of him f***ing his daughter's attacker? <laughs> if I understand him as a loving father who's just been pushed to the edge to this degree, how else do you explain him having, at least on his side, a completely willful sexual relationship with the person that it attacked his daughter. So at that point, it has nothing to do with the love or the desire to protect one's daughter. At this point, she's already dead. It is instead a reclamation of his rightful power as the patriarch in these social structures, right? And that in and of itself is its own violence, the very violence one could argue of the film. So in that way, when Vincente is forced into a feminine body. It is in order for him to sustain gendered sexual violence by a man in a way that he has perpetuated gendered sexual violence as a man. Robert is simply using this as an opportunity to rebuild and reclaim those structures that he lost due to another man's sexual violence. And it's not the first time that he's been kind of, for lack of a better word, cuckled um, by other men. It's um, Zika and his wife, Zika and Vera slash Vincente. Vincente and Norma. These women are all by proxy of them being in his familial structure are his entitlements and they were encroached upon and they were desecrated by other men, particularly through sex. And therefore the movie presents that sex, both as in sexual intercourse, as well as sex, meaning more correctly gender, are the ways to establish a rightful center as a patriarch for Robert. Turning Vincente into Vera, therefore accomplishes two goals for him. One, avenging Norma, and two, returning to a life in which he had a doting wife that was solely sexually centered around him. Be in a fantasy place where he was allowed to stay in his place in his kingdom and that he was never kind of besmirched off of that throne. Vera therefore becomes the ultimate conquest. Vera had desecrated Robert's daughter and Vera looks like his wife who was desecrated by his brother who he doesn't know is his brother. It's a long story. If you didn't see the first video, you have no idea what I'm talking about. And if we think of Vera as the ultimate conquest to not only avenge his daughter, but to lessen her attacker to a woman, again, he never identifies as a woman, but to a woman, it speaks loudly of the misogyny that interlaces these actions as well. Vera becomes an observable possession, just as how a wife and a daughter should have stayed in an idealized world and an idealized existence that Robert expected for himself. Pristine in a box to be watched, but not to be touched by an undeserving man. That isn't to say that he didn't love his wife or his daughter. Um, in some way, I'll leave that up to you to decide whether or not that is the case. Side note, I realized as I said that about the wife and daughter uh, being 
two entities completely entangled around Robert vaguely sound incestuous. And that's not what I'm getting at. What I'm saying though, is that he does understand Norma as an extension of his own self, not as a person. Because again, how else can we make sense of you rationalizing a sexual relationship with a person that attacked your daughter, right? This isn't for me to say that he did or didn't love his wife or his daughter. I think that's up, up to interpretation what that means. But again, his actions arguably don't affirm that love if it does exist at all. Only shows the desperate actions of a man grasping at revenge and patriarchy and specifically doing so through the very way he was slighted through sex. Therefore, it doesn't seem strange that sex is also his ruination. He is killed immediately after uh, beginning a sexual relationship with Vera at that point, but Vincente, having succumbed to the beguiling of someone whom he sees as a woman, someone less intimidating and whom he undermines because of it. As time passes, Vincent also plays into and understands the actions that must be used to reclaim some level of power, though now in a feminine body. Traditionally or stereotypically, those things are seduction, persuasion, manipulation. And in this context and in many contexts in a very misogynistic viewpoint, those are all seen as very feminine machinations of power. Therefore, Vincente haven't accepted to some degree that performing as a woman is the way to grasp at autonomy Vincente does as such and is ultimately successful in that way. Perhaps then this movie, or rather the dynamic between Robert and Vincente play on the misogynistic fear of women's beguilement and danger through such seduction. However, one could argue that this plays into a lot of misogynistic tropes as opposed to dismantling them or shining a light to them. And being that it was taken place through the act of a gender reassignment surgery, one could argue that it could also propel the movie into kind of um, traditional fear mongering, transphobic rhetoric. But I will get more into that later because I wanna talk a little bit about Vincente as a person and how I hate him. One of the more definitive issues I have with this movie is how Vincente is presented. I hate that there seems to be this undercurrent and this understanding of him as a victim. When we are first introduced to him, we see the small, cheerful man who works in a dress shop, boyish, flirtatious, shitty and misogynistic, but in many ways um, presented quite harmless. And I wasn't opposed to that at first because all types of men are shitty and misogynist and perpetuate misogynistic, rapey rhetoric all the time. So it doesn't surprise me. But my issue is that as the movie continued and we kind of find out that Vincent has been through all these things and was forced to become Vera, so to speak. I hate it that there seemed to be this undercurrent of him as a sympathetic character because he's not. I don't really understand what the movie's point was in regards to Vincent. Was it to declare him more innocent than guilty? Um, I talked about how he sexually assaulted somebody and the way that it's framed in the movie is that he he was he didn't know what was happening like he he was he he was confused he was high blah, blah, blah. so there seems to be this ambiguity which is not he still sexually assaulted somebody you know what a, what are you trying to say? <laughs> He's more innocent than guilty or that his punishment was way more than his crime. Or even that in this kind of cynical way that Vincent would be deemed maybe by society as innocent regardless because many sex offenders go free. But personally, I don't think this movie is, is taking that cynical viewpoint. At least I don't know. I don't feel that it's doing that. I think it really is putting Vincente in a position to be an unfortunate bystander of Robert's grief and his insanity, which isn't true. <laughs> He's a rapist. But yeah, this movie really presents it that his, by proxy of his treatment throughout the rest of the movie, it makes it seem like his crime is so minuscule in comparison to what Robert eventually does to him. And I don't like that. And then because we as an audience are following all of this r truly horrific shit that's happening to him, by the time we get to the end and Vincente announces that he is Vincente to his mother and his coworker, I, I, I have this cynical feeling that I'm supposed to see this as like a triumph. 
like returning home and being able to exclaim his identity as if he like left to some unjust war <laughs> and was able to finally come home and triumph and reclaim who he is to his mother and and co-worker i just found it very shitty i didn't like it because what, what am i supposed to feel by the end of that like oh yay i don't know like i don't i don't yay it i don't think it's yay i think it's uh pretty sucky actually <laughs> if we look at vincente and what he represents as far as like a person being able to to affirm their gender, that's a whole different argument. But Vincente as a person sucks. <laughs> Which leads me on to kind of the most nuanced and admittedly controversial part of this movie, which is the exploration of forced gender reassignment as horror. You know, is this like an empathetic exploration of the affirmation of one's gender or is it just a perpetuation of a lot of transphobic rhetoric? So I don't know if anyone picked up on it. I tried to keep it mentally straight in my head, but I will see through editing, but I've been trying to refer to Vincente as who is observing him up until this point, referring to him as Vera, if we're talking about how Robert sees Vincente, uh, or referring to him as Vincente when Vincente is referring to himself. I hope I kept that straight in my head while speaking, but who knows? But going forth, I'm gonna just refer to Vincente as Vincente because that's who he is, right? He never chose to transition, therefore, He's Vincente, he's a man, regardless of how he appears outwardly to the rest of the world, right? Vincente's forced transition brings to light a lot of mini conflicts that this movie seems to have with people, especially in the present day. Maybe it wasn't as much of a, a mainstream conversation to really consider, and maybe it still isn't to be quite frank with you, but I do think that this movie can be seen as transphobic. But I also think it could be seen as a very viscerally empathizing work for say a largely cisgendered audience who don't quite understand what it's like to be trapped in the wrong body. Now, like I said in part one, I, I don't really think I, as a cisgender woman, have a right to definitively say one way or another, you know, like I, what the f my opinion really matter in regards to this. But I, I mean, some people were saying, well, we still kind of want to know your viewpoint on it. Um, so I'll lend that, but again, take it with a grain of salt. Again, it's coming from me who will undoubtedly have certain blind spots as a cisgender woman. Originally when I heard about this movie and I kind of like, was saying vaguely on Twitter several months ago, like, oh, I think I wanna watch this. This sounds like a lot going on. Remember, I got a few people that were kind of like, oh, it's transphobic. And when I actually watched it, I was personally very confused because I was like, Vincente isn't trans. Like he didn't choose to transition and, and isn't the whole point of transitioning the act of affirming one's own bodily autonomy, right? So my original reading of the movie lended much more towards like this sort of gendered violence, eye for an eye kind of reading and, and the misogyny in, engulfed in that, right? But I, I admittedly didn't really see it as like a trans movie because who's trans here? <laughs> like, if, again, if anything, I'd imagine that a largely cis audience watching this may have this newfound empathy perhaps to the concept of being forced in a body that does not align with your own gender identity. So arguably, especially in 2011, this might've been somewhat helpful. Hearing more opinions in regards to, especially from trans folks, because again, what opinion does mine matter um, in, in the consideration of this, you know? There became a lot more conversation around particularly how tr the transitioning process and a trans body and those surgeries have been played up for laughs and horror for many, many years, which is true <laughs> in media and could present a particular message, even if it didn't want to. to the biases of a largely ignorant and transphobic audience. And that in and of itself could be something to be concerned about. So I went a searching on the internet for trans people who had actually written anything about this movie in um, English. And I didn't find a whole lot, which was unfortunate, but because I, uh, kind of left the last video quite open-ended and I wanted to hear your opinions. I actually got contacted either directly or um, via comments by a lot of viewers of mine who actually are trans who wanted to lend their own opinions on it. And the, as you can imagine, the opinions really ran the gamut. And I figured that would be the best way to figure out how people were affected by them telling you how they were <laughs> affected. Is this the most scientific way to do it? Probably not. But as I kind of, 
talked about in the first video, I didn't want to like encroach on a trans person, but if someone wanted to like say anything to me, I'd be more than happy to listen, you know? Cause I didn't want to trigger anybody like, hey, random trans person that is minding their own f business. Would you like to be triggered? <laughs> and tell me how you feel. <laughs> like I didn't want to do that. Some people wanted to like lend their opinions anyway. And I think that's, first of all, very, very cool. Can I just say that my viewers are some of the most intelligent and most well-spoken people on the planet. Love that for us. <laughs> Like I said, yeah, opinions, even from trans audiences, at least within my audience, are very running the gamut. Hi, so in this part of the video, I stupidly tried to make a relatively concise list of opinions from trans viewers who were in the comment section, only to realize that defeats the whole f purpose of getting the opinions of trans people. <laughs> so instead, uh, instead of being a jackass, I decided instead to just read off some comments that I got. Also, I'm gonna uh, mute out people's names because I'm not trying to like put you on blast or anything. You know, I was just like saying, oh, here's a comment that has an opinion. So just, yeah, I don't know, just to be on the safe side. Okay. It's about an open discussion on gender, sex, and how they are different and are part of us. Vincent was always a cisgender heterosexual man as the movie acknowledged. He was overcompensating in some ways, but he was never anything else. Even in the end, the forced physical transition and psychological training failed, unlike most trans people who accept that part of them. Vincent wasn't Vera because Vera never existed. She wasn't a part of him. He had to live in the nightmare of trans people living in a body that isn't yours, trying to accept and change that. It's quite fitting for this message that the movie ends with I am Vincente. Some people might use this movie to spread a message about how you can't change your gender and you are what you were assigned at birth. The movie doesn't indicate that though. Vincente is forced into surgeries and medication that alter his body and breaks at the walls of his head. Yet because he knows his gender identity, he is Vincent, he is a man. Nothing will change that for him. How I know I am name, I am a woman. No matter what people try to convince me otherwise, I am a woman. In the end, the movie is ignorant in some ways, but harmless overall. As a doctor, I appreciate that they actually did a full process of transition. Also years and years of surgical intervention, avoiding the instant transformation into a woman after a magical pussy lip and boob surgery. Trans man here, and you're definitely right that it could go either way. I definitely don't think this movie did the best job representing these surgeries, especially when you consider the long, long, long history of transphobia, particularly directed towards trans women in cinema in general, and how trans feminine bodies are used as horror in and of themselves. That being said, taking the story at face value I think it does raise a lot of questions about consent and the horror of having the control of your own body t being taken away. By the end of the movie, Vincente says himself that he is Vincent, so there's not really any question that he's a man. From a certain angle, you might even read his story as being more similar to that of a trans man than a trans woman. All this to say, it's a very messy, but definitely very interesting take on gender and consent and a very unique movie in its own right. On the gender note, I feel like whether or not the movie strikes you as transphobic would largely depend on how you read Vincente as a trans man or as a trans woman. Because as a trans guy, I heard they forced him into a female slash feminine body and just think, wow, same, especially with the very explicitly medical angle to everything. Medical gatekeeping is one of the main ways that trans people who want to seek out medical transition are systematically violated. The whole process often being an exercise in degradation and humiliation, unless you really luck out on your doctors. So seeing it reversed almost feels like an opt way to explain how trans men feel, the fact that Vincente assaulted someone notwithstanding, locked in, and how there's a sexual element to it, not necessarily lustful or anything, that transphobia relies on people staying in their reproductive boxes. As a result, trans men experience a lot of a sort of misplaced misogyny. The transphobic rhetoric directed at trans men features a lot of infantilization, characterizing us as misled little girls, and a huge concern for our reproductive future. Irreversible damage, the transgender craze seducing our daughters by Abigail Schreier. The prime transphobic text on trans men and trans masculine people is a booklet screed on how trans men are just being chopped up and sterilized by medical transition. Trans men and trans masculine people, having been raised under the presumption that we are cis girls, have a lot of reproductive pressure put on us, and this is reflective in how we experience transphobia. However, if you see Vincente as a trans woman, this reads as incredibly transphobic and relying on the trans misogynistic view of trans women as mutilated men. I don't have as much to say from this angle from my own lack of experience. TLDR, Vincente as a trans guy, 
Same, Vincente has a trans gal, yikes. I think a lot of comments are saying it's not transphobic because it was not consensual and generally not supposed to be representation of quote unquote regular trans experiences. But my thoughts are about the director, the intent and the care with which this film was made. Prior to making this, Almodovar made Bad Education way better than this film, which is very much a trans movie centering on a trans woman played by a cis man. So I know that Almodovar wasn't completely careless or totally oblivious to these things, but this movie felt like purposeful trauma porn and I don't like a transish storyline being used in this way. It's definitely a huge part of the shock factor and the sick factor. I don't root for anyone, which I don't think is totally necessary for a film at all, but it feels like I was supposed to or feel conflicted about. And it's like, I don't know, a mother of our an essay against women and that one trans movie shows he has thought about these themes before, but this is definitely one of his weaker films, if not the absolute worst. I don't hate it or him or anyone if they like it, but it's a little bit of the we don't talk about Bruno of his filmography. And as an essay survivor, I regret watching it and I don't recommend it, even for those who think they've seen it all, but that's all me. Trans person here, this sounds like a great movie, but I feel like the transphobia is rampant, but also seems to critique how some men view trans women as like sexual objects. That's all I can really say now. Wow, I'm just shocked. As a trans person, this movie feels like it plays into harmful transphobic stereotypes to me. Conservatives rave about, quote, forcing transitioning mostly on kids and confusing them constantly. And this horror slash thriller movie about madmen forcing transitioning on someone is just playing into that fear mongering. Honestly, my biggest criticism would be that I don't like that it's ambiguous if Vera slash Vicente is actually trans. If you were to do those procedures to assist man, it would probably cause him extreme dysphoria. That could have been an interesting route to take, but that isn't really shown with Vera she seems almost indifferent to it, which would imply that she is not a cis man. If she is actually a trans woman, what sort of message is that supposed to be? Did Robert just get lucky that the person he decided to torture happened to be a trans woman? Is the movie trying to say that you can brainwash someone to think they are trans? If so, that's transphobic. Also, if she is supposed to be trans, I don't like that the movie had her assault someone. We already have too much media portraying trans women as violent. Hi, trans man here, and I have a lot to say about this movie. I really enjoy Pedro Almodovar's films, and I also personally take comfort in body horror media as a way to cope with dysphoria. So yes, La Pia Abito was a hard watch, but I love this movie. Horror is a great way to represent everyday hard realities, and this film does exactly that for me. Gender dysphoria is awful to live with sometimes, so I think it's a really fitting theme to explore in such a way. But of course, this is extremely complicated, especially because it's almost impossible to avoid it being sensationalized and the trans body slash existence itself being seen as a horror element. I can't even count the times I've seen a lot of people talk about this movie and the gender reassignment process itself, not only in the context of the film, with a sense of morbid curiosity. The major focus in this film is the body and that's really what makes it great for me. From the horrifying idea of losing autonomy over it to the dysphoria elements and the hard relationship that one can have with it as a survivor of trauma. V's story definitely felt like it could be interpreted a lot of ways. Honestly, it reads most as a detransition narrative to me. By that, I mean the vast majority of people who detransition do it because they are pressured or forced to by others. So V literally being forced into a different body against their will feels narratively reminiscent of that. It also strikes me as a very literal interpretation of what happens when a trans person enacts a crime or other taboo action. Often people only grant us our gender as a reward for good behavior and are quick to misgender us when they don't like us. This could be seen on a larger scale with the issues of trans people being incarcerated in prisons that align with the wrong gender. V being literally imprisoned for a crime, albeit in a vigilante justice type of way, directly coincides with the forced sex change as part of a punishment really reminds me of that. Good for him, I guess. Killing Robert? I don't know, but you're right. It did make me uncomfortable, but nothing beyond that, I guess, hearing about the movie. But in terms of the forced reassignment surgery, I can see it going both ways. On one hand, it could be seen as a reinforcement of the they're gonna force kids to transition into their trans cult viewpoint that some transphobes have. On the other hand, I can see it as a kind of, he's actually a man, but he is stuck in the body of a woman pro-trans message, but from what I've heard, basically just the synopsis, it doesn't go into that super deep. Overall, this movie is very weird and doesn't seem like too much of a reinforcement of transphobic ideas to me, just playing on ideas of gender and surgery. It's at the very least interesting and original. <laughs> okay, so those were some of the thoughts and opinions of some of my trans viewers, and I wanna thank you all for um, lending your viewpoints and your experiences to the discussion of the movie. I am recording this a few days after International Transgender Day of Visibility. So with that said, I wanted to uh, donate to Protect and Defend Trans Youth Fund. If you would like to donate, I will be linking that down below as well. Or also feel free to donate to any of your local LGBTQ advocacy groups and donation centers. 
Thank you. So these are some of the general kind of interpretations that I saw throughout my comments. I'm sure there's more, I'm sure people have more. I will just say all, all of the, it makes sense to me. Like, I feel like there's a lot to be unpacked here and that's what's so terrifying and, and interesting about the movie. I, I do appreciate that the, the movie was created and is being able to be used as a vessel for this conversation. Um, and that's about as much as I can really say on that. With that said, here's my final thoughts. Nothing. <laughs> I feel everything and nothing at the same time. Again, I enjoyed this movie. Um, and it would be silly, especially after all of the unpacking we've done today to suggest that there's something moralistic really that I could say about the film when depending on how you look at it, it could be a trans misogynistic ball of fire or something that really causes audiences across all gender spectrums to think and consider the horrors it would be like to live in the body that doesn't feel in alignment with your own gender identity. I think it, it did present a situation in which we had to confront the horrors of gendered violence and for being just superficially you know, an entertaining movie. I can't help but applaud it. But with that said, that doesn't really ease my problems that I have with the film and how it could be used to perpetuate some anti-trans rhetoric when theoretically that may be quite the opposite of what the purpose was. It cannot wholly be discussed in a poorly put together YouTube video by yours truly, who is in no way an authority. <laughs> but it was still uh, interesting to talk about. So that's why I talked about it, but yeah. Next week, we'll come back with another bad video because you guys don't want to hear me be a professor every week. And I don't want to hear me being a professor every week. Baby, I had to pull out the stop. This felt like college again. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> this is fun, but I'm tired. Just, I was thinking about watching Beyonce's Obsessed, right? Right? I remember it being bad. I wonder when I come back to it, will it actually be as bad as I remember it being? Hmm. Anyway, that's all for this week, folks. If you liked today's video, feel free to like today's video. Follow me on all my social media, Instagram, Twitter, both of which are KennyJD. Also feel free to follow me on More Butter. Um, I have a podcast there where I talk about movies that bombed at the box office or got really bad uh, reviews and it's called In Defense Of. They gave me a gavel and I'm really annoying about it. By the time you see this, I think the last video was me talking about Scott Pilgrim. And so now me and Amanda the Jedi are gonna fight. <laughs> But anyway, that's all for today, folks. Uh, I will see you guys next time.